administration this morning, and I also want to thank Harvey and Mary Waller for letting us use their two-wheel vehicle. Uh, the person that's going to speak to you this morning is Morris Kerr. A lot of you know Morris already. He's been a friend of mine for a long time, and he basically has spent his entire life working with horses, originally first with hunters. Um, he worked for some of the great old horsemen, Jack Redmond. Um, the rest of it I really can't remember all through the years, but he worked for Mr. Pemberton as well, who was one of the early members and was the past president of the Carrier Association. And he's currently working for Stephen Marilyn McFarland in Shelbyville, Kentucky. And we want to thank them for letting us have Morris for a while today. And at any rate, Morris is a professional coachman. He will be talking to you about safety as far as some of the things that he sees around when he goes into driving competitions and everything. And while he's living in the States at this time, I do think that the Canadians feel that it gives them a bit of representation here as well. So please welcome Morris here. vehicle, 
and they figure, oh, it's, it's going to be good for a hundred years, because I had one that was a hundred years old. But it isn't. After you buy a new vehicle, after about six months, you have to go underneath and tighten all the nuts. And a lot of the times you'll get a half turn, a turn on each nut on a new vehicle. After the wood shrinks a little bit, then everything becomes loose. And a lot of people don't realize that, and it didn't happen on the antique vehicle because it's 100 years old. It was tight 99 and a half years ago. So these are the things that you have to watch for, and a lot of the people do not crawl underneath the vehicle and look for these things. They look at it from this angle, and everything looks great. As we go on to the four-wheel vehicle, the same thing with this. If it's a new vehicle, you want to get underneath it after six months or three months and tighten it all up. Make sure it's all tight. Um, one of the things with a four-wheel vehicle, um, a lot of people buy a, an antique carriage on steel and then they decide that they don't like the noise, so they change it to rubber. And there's stoppers underneath here that are, for rubber are rollers and for steel they're solid. And a lot of people don't change them to the rollers after they change them to the rubber. Because you, when that rubber comes against the solid steel, that's when your carriage will tip over as well. So you always want to make sure that when you change it to rubber, that you always make sure that you change and put a roller underneath so that that rubber can come against and roll. Um, the same thing as I said. Now, what we're going to do here, we're getting into a paired vehicle with a drop pole. Um, there's evener straps on here. You always want to have a bit of play on these evener straps. You don't want them solid. You want them to be able to move. Because on this type of vehicle, um, you want everything to be free. You want the horse to be able to come and go a little bit and have some movement. You never want the horse to be solid in his harness or in his work. On these spring-loaded shackles, they're very easy to put on and off, and 90% of the people don't put a strap around them. You should always have a little strap around the spring or around through here and around the axle. And a lot of people, if you don't understand, could come up and pastor and have a look at it, and I'll explain it to you. So that was very important. In a drop pole, to me, a drop pole should always have a neck yoke. It evens out the weight on the horses. If you have a drop pole, a drop pole with pole straps, your pole should be slung back at the, at the carriage on a spring so it helps to hold the, the pole up. If you don't, the weight of that pole on the pole straps will start to make your horses pull out from the pole. A lot of people wonder why their horses pull away from the pole. It's because the pole straps tighten up and they're just automatically going to pull against them. With a, um, a neck yoke like this, what a lot of people will do too is put on a, a neck yoke that's too narrow. And th the same thing will happen. If these uh, straps are pulling out against the horse, then the horse will pull against it. And I've seen a lot of it happen. Thanks, Steve. I'll just try and demonstrate to you. It's hard to hold the mic and demonstrate at the same time. But the idea, like this, is a nice wide neck yoke, and you always want that pole strap on a neck yoke to face in like this, okay? You never want them to pull out against it. It'll be the same thing as a pole strap. Then your horses will start to pull out. And I've seen, I've had one person ask me about that quite a few years ago, and the first thing I said, that your neck yoke is not wide enough. That's why your ponies are pulling out. So that's one of the things. Having a safety strap on a, on a neck yoke like this is very important. And a lot of people are worried about this coming off the end. When you put your horses to, the horse should be right up pretty well close to the neck yoke. Okay? Then you adjust your traces. And once you get them adjusted, all you have to do is unbuckle this and pull on this to see if this will come forward. 
And if it doesn't come forward, it won't come off. These are very safe, really, if you're put too properly. Thank you, Steve. And the one thing, too, about a pole like this, people, I see a lot of them that are hooked too long. They put their horses away out from the whiffle tree. The idea is to always get your horses as close to the carriage as possible. And with whiffle trees being up this high, your horse's hocks are underneath the whiffle trees. So there's no fear of them hitting their hocks. So on a carriage like this, I would have my horse hooked at least a foot. The, the rear end of them, or the, the hocks would be a foot away from this whiffle tree if I was putting a horse a pair to this. And therefore, it makes it very easy for you to stroke them with your whip. You don't have to have a whip that's a, have a stick on it 12 feet long to, keep, to, to reach your horse. That is another very important thing. On these drop poles, which I see a lot, not a lot of, but some, is sometimes you don't get the proper pole with the carriage. And back here at the back, where it's attached on to the, the axles, it has to have the right curve for the right height of horse. If you have the wrong curve to these, this pole, the whipple tree will be a way higher than your neck yoke. You always want your neck yoke a little higher than your whipple trees, so therefore the pole is going uphill, not downhill. Which, when you're being, a, being judged, and um, you come in the ring, the first thing the judge sees is this pole going along like this, which is not the proper. You look at all the coaches and the brakes and all that, but the fixed poles are always going up on a slope. So it makes it the appearance and the action a lot better, a lot easier for your horse. Uh, before we move along, um, the thing that we talk about is safety all the time, making sure that when, before you go out that your wheels are well greased. Uh, always before you, you go and harness your horse, you always want to check your carriage. You don't want to go and get the horse and then try and get the carriage out of the shed. Then the other thing too that a lot of people don't realize that most of these wheels all have a little bit of a dish to them. And you always want to make sure that you know how much of a dish is in each wheel. Because over the years, they could straighten up a bit. And when they straighten up too much, then you lose your strength of your wheels. And I had that happen to me once. I restored a, a buggy for Mr. Pemberton. And after I got it all painted, put it in the carriage house, a few days later, I go in and see one front wheel that's straightened up on me was all painted. Lucky enough, I found a Mennonite that fixed it for me without putting a scratch on it. He put it back in a press, brought the dish back, and shortened the, the channel, and it's still nice. So all these little things uh, are very important when it comes to driving. Um, the thing that... Uh, just trying to think of other things that I ran into over the years. I've never used drop poles too much because I've always been into the coaching and the brakes, but I have used them and this is what I've found. The neck yoke is the best. As we go along, then we'll go into a harness. Um, over the years, I've found I, a lot of people don't like to clean harness, but that's when you're, when you're cleaning your harness is you're checking to make sure that it's safe and sound, that your buckles aren't bent, uh, the tongue of the buckle isn't bent, the, and the worst part is, is up at the, the top of the buckle, where it's around, the leather's around the buckle. That's where it'll rot and rust out the most. And that's the thing that you have to keep saddle soap the most, is around that part of the buckle, which is the hardest part, the saddle soap. The straight part won't break. It's where the buckle joints to the leather is usually where it's going to break. And with the, with the steel inside there, will rust over the years and rot the leather as well. So these are the things that you have to keep watching for all the time when you're cleaning your harness. Uh, it's hard because a lot of us don't have the time nowadays, so we just 
throw the work harness up and, and put it on the next day dirty. And even if you clean it once a week, it's a safe time. Um, up to the, the, at the bit, when you hook your reins onto the bit, you always want to make sure that that strap isn't wearing through, that goes through up and down on the bits all the time. If you drive a lot, that should be replaced about once a year, if not more, to make sure that it doesn't break. Um, there's different types of harness um, uh, that's safer than others, and Steve probably has gone through all that with you through your, your safety check. That's very important to have the right part of the right type of harness to the right carriage. If you don't have, then it won't ride right, it won't ride smooth. For the horse, especially in a two-wheel carriage, the, you want the flexion in the shafts, and if you don't have it uh, properly balanced, it's very hard on the horse and very annoying for the driver to be driving along, <laughs> bobbling along. That's one of the hardest things is balancing a two-wheel carriage. Um, as we move along um, to the harness, one thing I don't like to see on driving bridles is brass bits. Brass is probably one of the softest materials that there is out. Um, I would be a little leery of it breaking, although I've had other types of bits break too as well. And number two is the brass bits are very hard to keep clean from the slobber. As soon as you put it in the horse's mouth and a little bit of slobber hits it, it becomes tarnished right away where your, your chrome or your stainless steel bits will stay nice even with the slobber all day. Um, your reins, I said, is very important. And uh, your traces, your hold backs, all the things to start the carriage to stop the carriage is very important, very important. As we move on to the training, which I like the most, is uh, in the past 20 years, I've broken a lot of uh, driving horses and, and trained a lot of driving horses and I found over the years when I'm breaking them that the best thing to do when you're long lining them after about a week when I'm long lining them in the center of the ring with me I have a, a jug from Javex with some stones in it and I have a soccer ball and that's how I break my driving horses with a jug with stones and a soccer ball and after they get used to the stones and the soccer ball, the noise doesn't bother them too much. And I've had horses that have been broken by other people that are afraid of noises, afraid of the whip, and they say, oh, you can't, you, you can't use a whip on my horse. Well, a whip is part of your driving aid, so you have to be able to use it on your horse. And after 10 minutes working with the whip, the horse would be used to the whip. It's just that the first touch, they might jump. And you just keep at it and at it. And that's another thing that I do with the young horse. While I'm long lining them with the lunge whip, and after I'm finished working them, they'll walk around in a small circle and I'll get them that I can throw that whip right over their back, around their stomach, gently, gently. So they're used to it. Um, and with the soccer ball, People think I'm crazy because they've come into the ring seeing me kicking a soccer ball past the horse. But I've had them the first few times, the horse go up this high in the air. But after 20 minutes of just booting it by them easy, they walk along with their head down and you can kick it between their legs anywhere. And they become very used to it. And it helps you when you get into traffic or uh, bicycles. Horses are afraid of bicycles going by. Well, this soccer ball doesn't make any noise going by, but all of a sudden they see it. After 20 minutes of it, they don't even bother with it. Same with the, the, the jug of stones. I'll be long lining a horse once he's used to it. I pick it up and just start gently with it until they get used to it, work gently with the stones. And as they get used to it, get used to it more and more, that bucket, uh, the jug of stones will be on the ground. And as I'm long lining, I'll come by the bucket of the stones and give it a kick. And it'll roll across and make an awful racket. The first few times they get up, after a while, you can kick that stones around and around the ring and the horse doesn't bother. All these little things help with the young horse, making sure that they're broke properly before you ever put them into the shafts. 
and again, I've heard of people that have long lined a horse for six months before they drive it. Well, <laughs> you'll never drive your horse if you've long lined him for six months because by then you have him so fit that he, everything that touches him bothers him. The main thing with breaking a horse and training a driving horse is getting them used to everything and breaking them on the long line. Same in traffic, if I have a horse that I'm not too sure of in traffic, I'll take him out on the long lines and walk him up and down the road or in the ditch along the traffic on the long lines first to make sure that I'm safe before I'll put him in a carriage and go up and down the road. These are all little things that are and make our life a little bit easier and a little safer. Talking about two-wheel carts in breaking horses, uh, I've heard of people breaking horses in a four-wheeler. Well, I guess if that's all you have, that's what you have to use. But I like a two-wheeler because, as you say, if they back up, they can't jack anything. I've been back into the ditch with a young horse with a two-wheeler, and finally we get turned around and get going forward. But I wouldn't have been able to do that with a four-wheeler. I would have been in trouble and had to jump out of it and grab the head. It's uh, a lot safer if you're breaking a young horse on the roads or everywhere to always have somebody with you and have a carriage that they can get out of in a hurry, which we don't all have. As we uh, keep talking about uh, safety, uh, I do a lot of show ring driving. And the biggest thing, too, I found with the show ring driving, a lot of horses are not used to different noises. And we have lots of times you'll get four-wheel carriages that people do not couple them up properly to the axle, and they'll go around the ring rattling. And you'll see them go by a horse, and the horse gets all tense. It's, it's hard. You, you get very annoyed at that person that doesn't attach the shafts properly. And there's one way of doing that. In this type of ball hitch, you can put a little leather shim inside around the ball, which tightens it up when you put the spring on and stops the rattling. Or if you have a, a straight bolt, uh, some of them clamp onto a straight bolt. I've wrapped the bolt before you clamp it on with uh, a little wrap of leather. Um, with a, just a straight bolt that goes through, if it rattles, then make sure you put a larger bolt through the hole so it doesn't rattle and annoy the horse. But as we go around the ring, we like our horse to be able to wear its ears and enjoy his, looks like he's enjoying his work. And if, with all the noise behind them, they're all going around with the ears back, and you wonder why they don't look good to the judge. That's the first thing the judge looks at, that as he comes in the ring, that your horse is enjoying his work and is nicely going forward and happy in his work. If he's got his ears pinned back, he's not happy in his work. So you won't even get looked at most of the time, unless there's only four or five in the class. We have to. Um, <clears throat> again, preparing a horse for the show ring. A lot of people don't drive in company at home. They only got one horse, so they can't drive in company. So it's very important if you're going into the show ring that you get out with some company and drive with them before you and pass each other. Keep passing and passing and drive along e beside each other. So your horse gets used to horses going up beside them. Um, and get the same coming to a, a drive like this, you always want to make sure that you get out in company before you come to a, a big conference like this because your horse is going to see a lot of horses and uh, get upset. And he might be upset for the first few days. And what I do with a, a horse, a young horse especially, when I come to an event like this, about a week before, I'll take him right off his grain and just feed him feed pulp and bran or something, you know, that bulk. And I'll take him off his grain, especially if I know he's going to be a bit hot. And as the drive goes on through a few days, then I'll start putting him back onto his grain. So therefore, your horse is getting a good education and not getting upset coming to an event and remembering that all his life. These are little things that I've found out over the years if you can give them a good start in life, that's what they'll remember the rest of their life. And that's what we always do with our kids. We try and give them a good start in life so they'll carry on through life. And that's what we try and do with our horses. Um, it's getting kind of dry. 
Um, just trying to think of a few other things that I've experienced over the years. Um, yeah, it's, I'm just thinking of something now. The, this coaching run yesterday, I noticed that um, I did one in Aiken one year with Mr. Pemberton. And the thing with a coaching run like this, you have to have your horses a lot fitter than you do if you come to a pleasure drive. And the thing that you have to try and remember is how fit you need your horse for the, the work that it's going to get. There's no use in having your horse fit enough to go 20 miles when you only have to go 10. And these are the things that you have to try and remember because to go 20 miles, you're going to have to work your horse an hour, an hour and a half every day. And the harder you work your horse at home, the more wear and tear you're putting on your horse. So the idea is you just put enough work in to go the distance that you have to go. I've heard, I used to do a lot of combined driving, and we'd finish section E, and I'd be sitting beside somebody, and they'd say, oh, my horse could go another section or another event right now. I said, well, what for? What's the, you know, all you're doing in all that training get your horse fit enough to do two events, you're wearing them out. And that's what a lot of people do in overtraining horses, is they break them down in the training. They don't enjoy the drive. Is there any questions at this time? Please come forward. <laughs> I won't like. I guess I answered everybody's questions then. In this day and age, we have to contend with a lot of plastic flying around, particularly white plastic. Yes, we do. A lot of gentlemen just said in this day and age, we have to put up with a lot of plastic flying around. Um, we do, and, and it's some things it's very hard to train for, but you have to. As you think of things that you might come across on your drives, as we get older, we have to start writing them down so we can train for it. And it's hard if we do keep our place at home so neat and tidy that we don't have any plastic flying around. Thank you. Excuse me a minute. But sometimes we have to make these things happen. Um, we do at home when we're training. We make, we make sure we drive together, um, pass each other. I had one leader years ago with Mr. Pemberton that another horse couldn't pass him. And I didn't have anybody else that could drive out with me when I was training. So my wife used to ride a horse alongside him down the road. We'd go out for an hour, an hour and a half, and she'd ride alongside for an hour, an hour and a half. That horse got used to it another horse beside him. Even though he had a lead horse beside him, it was just the other horse passing or a carriage passing him. All these little things, you've got to think of how you can train your horse to be used to everything. It's, uh, I know it's pretty near impossible, but we have to stop and think of what we're going to meet. It's so nice driving here on this farm that we don't meet half the problems here that we would on the road. And it's so hard to train for the roads nowadays because people do not slow up for carriages. I've had them with foreign hands when we're driving down the road come within a foot of the carriage zooming by and never slow down. So it's very hard and you have to be very careful of um, oncoming traffic and traffic that's passing you. Uh, one instant, one day, when I was at Mr. Pemberton's, I was training a young horse, to, lucky enough to a two-wheel cart, and she was just a green horse, and over this hill comes a combine. Lucky enough, he didn't have a header on, but he never slowed down for me. And this horse went up the bank on me. As the combine went by, lucky enough, I got her back down off the bank, without tipping the two-wheel cart over. But it was a training cart, it was nice and low, and I knew I was safe. But you, pardon me, you never know when these things are going to occur. And as I say, a lot of people do not slow down for us nowadays. Yes? Do you have your opinion on when your 
driving on the road, how much you give and take to the truck traffic that's coming and going. Yes, and how much uh, should you take up your half of the road when you're driving? What I try and do is I drive in the same area that I would drive a car. I do not get too close to the ditch, or I don't uh, try to get over the white line or the yellow line. I try and stay in the same path that I would take a car down. Uh, lots of times what we see is we get a line up behind us, and if we pull over too close to the ditch, somebody will crowd you. Next thing you know, you're right in the ditch. So what I always try and do is keep it to my side of the road. I don't worry about the cars behind. If they get mad at me, it's sorry, but we all pay our taxes, and we can all drive down the road as you could drive down the road in your car at five miles an hour, you know, and they can't kick you off the road. So you always want to keep your side of the road. Yes? How do you get two horses to pull together? Well, now, that's not the safety. <laughs> it's, I, can, I can go up briefly on that. Um, it's difficult, especially if you have one that's very keen and one that's very lazy. And the way I try and, and do it is I feed them individually. If I have a very keen horse in the pair and a very lazy horse, the lazier horse will get more grain, the keen horse will get none for a while. And what I do with the lazy horse, I hook him to a stone boat and I work him individually so he learns to pull. That's the problem with the lazy horse. They just don't know how to pull. Uh, and most of the time, people are trying to concentrate on pulling the, the keen horse back, and you get them all crooked. So you want to teach the lazier horse to work. And that's how I do it, is with a stone boat in sand. I don't do it with a stone boat on gravel, because it would uh, make them very keen. <laughs> But if you just ride along on the stone boat, and I do it quite often with the wheelers to make sure that they can work when we want them to work and uh, get into their work. Uh, a lot of horses, there's different, well, you can go into it for a long time with pairs. A lot of horses that don't pull are excitable, and they come behind the bit. So it's bridling them properly, putting the right bit in their mouth. Uh, if they come behind the bit, they need a softer bit. If they're above the bit, sometimes they, they need to get a mouth on them so they can get a head down and pull. If a horse's head's too high, he can't pull. There's so many different reasons why a horse won't pull. He could not be comfortable in his collar. There's a, you know, a lot of different reasons. Anything else? If you've had the disaster, you've had a runaway, you've had a wreck, what you've got is a wreck carriage and a horse that is totally out of his mind. Where do you go from here? Things are calm. You don't have any broken bones yet. Where do you go from here with this horse? Okay, did everybody hear? If you have a wreck or a runaway and your horse has gotten quite frightened from it, and I've rebroke quite a few horses for the, from this, and sometimes it's happened at shows and everybody's going around giving the person advice, oh, you gotta get them right back in the shafts right away, you know, and they'll come to me and they'll say, Morris, what should I do? I said, just take the horse home, turn him out for a week, bring him to me in a week, and we'll start all over again. If you try and do that horse right away, he is so uptight, so nervous, that you probably would have another runaway. And I've seen some that don't. But that's very unusual. I've seen people that have had runaways and get in the carriage and just keep on driving. You know. Well, some horses are very forgiving and other ones aren't. But the ones that aren't, what I'll do is I'll take and start them all over again. I'll start them with nice, quiet, long lining, the stones, the soccer ball, and uh, dragging the tire again. I'll start them all over until I know that they're safe put in the shaft. Just one more question. How, how do you feel about uh, talking about harnessing? How do you feel about synthetic harness? S synthetic harness? It's 
It's good for training. The only thing that you have to watch that it doesn't rub the horse. The thing with the synthetic harness, it doesn't always fit well. It doesn't mold to the horse as well as leather. Leather, after it's been used and sweat a little bit with the leather into the sweat, or the sweat into the leather, sorry, it'll start molding to the horse and you won't get the sore spots. But with um, nylon or synthetic, it never really molds to the horse. You have to make sure that you have the right angle of everything so it isn't pulling the wrong way and rub your horse. And you'll see a lot of people with synthetic harness that has a whole lot of fuzzies under it, which I don't like. Um, especially if I'm judging a class, I hate to see fuzzies underneath pads. It tells the judge right away that the harness doesn't fit the horse. He doesn't have to go over and look at it. You're telling them right away. I'm afraid that I have to wrap up right now. I got the sign. So if there's any more questions, uh, feel free to come up and I'll do the best I can to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much for doing it for us. We appreciate it greatly, and he certainly gave you a lot of wonderful advice to follow. One thing I would like to announce that nobody is really aware of yet is the Bugatti Coupe that has been in the front uh, entrance way. This afternoon is owned by Harvey and Mary Waller. To my knowledge, it has never been put to in public in America before. I think it has only been driven once in this country when it was owned by John Kluge. It probably was only put to in Europe when it was owned by Baron Cassier maybe two or three times. This afternoon, Harvey and Mary brought it here just so that everyone could see it and enjoy it. It's probably one of the rarest carriages in America. Bugatti, who is a famous car maker, to my knowledge, only ever built four vehicles. Um, at any rate, they will be putting it to in the courtyard here this afternoon at 5 o'clock. They're then going to take it out and we'll be outside here and we'll give everybody opportunities to take pictures of it and everything and we certainly appreciate them bringing it here for everyone to see and enjoy. So it'll be 5 o'clock this afternoon right before the tailgate competition. Thank you. There is a short break now. The next talk will be at noon in the speaker's room. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.